This episode of Within the Wires is brought to you by Blue Apron. Check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash WTW. You will love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home-cooked meals from blueapron.com slash WTW. And now, your audio guide of the Ulster Museum, 1973. Welcome to the Ulster Museum in Belfast. I'm the Director of Collections, Mary Brethnock. As we enter the new decade of the 1970s, we face many changes to the art world. Many national borders have fallen away, our world joining together in economic and political unity, but as history changes before our eyes, so does it stay the same. The Ulster Museum, part of the Collected Museums of Western Europa, is proud to present Red Love, the passion of Claudia Etiano sponsored by the Harriman Family Trust. These are Etiano's most popular works, many from the mid-1960s when her career was at its height. Sunshine Afternoon, Still Life with Tomato Plant and Sword, and even a recently discovered repainting of Still Life with Cat. It's been some months since anyone has seen Etiano. Some have even claimed her absence is sinister, that she is missing, that she may even be dead a long and brilliant career possibly cut short at its peak. While we feel it's best to refrain from sensationalist speculation, we are also loath to promise more art when we cannot be sure there is more to come. Thank you for choosing to take our audio cassette tour. Your audio guide today will be Raimata Manga Kahia, herself an esteemed artist and friend to Atieno. The audio tour begins at the south entrance of Art Gallery 3. The tour follows a counterclockwise pattern around the exhibit. Each piece with an accompanying audio lecture will be noted with a blue star on the numbered title card and there will be a tone on the recording to indicate where you may pause the cassette before moving on to the next work. Please enjoy your visit to Ulster Museum and the exhibit Red Love. Painting 101, Still Life with Tomato Plant and Sword, by Claudia Artiano, Oil on Canvas, 1962. It is one of her most discussed and debated works, and is one of the collection of paintings that shifted her career from successful artist to celebrity. As much a celebrity as a painter can be, while still alive, of course. The painting sold at Sotheby's in 1969 for nearly £1 million, and is on loan to this exhibit. Many critics admire the gentle and crafty hand at work here. Notice the thin strokes of orange and pink, creating the sunny glare on the tomato. Atiano nearly exposes the texture of the canvas with such thin passes of the brush. It looks almost like watercolours rather than oil, and it is shallower than the rest of her painting. Lean closely to the left side to see this remarkable detail. What is exposed? What is vulnerable? You'll notice that the titular sword is not visible here, but just past the trellis and the tomato plant you can see a nearly empty garden. The grass is mangy and uneven but what appears as a large blotch of unusable dirt is actually a mound. The sword of this work's title has been buried in the garden. This painting premiered at the Berkshire Museum where Atiano was living at the time as a resident artist in the former United States. Atiano's home now is in Cornwall. It's a large house somewhere along the road to disrepair. Sitting alone, on an island, some distance from the mainland. My first few visits to Cornwall, Claudia and I had tea at a cafe called Joya's, named for Charmagne's sword. 
We were served sandwiches and scones, and in the back, there was a small garden with sparse grass and a small, insipid vegetable plot. The tomato plant was the only thing that grew well there, but often the squirrels stole them just as they reached maturity. The owner of Joyeuse, a petite-figured man named Jennifer, who wore square-rimmed glasses and wool leggings, hung his handmade replica of the eponymous sword just above the doorway to the garden area in the back. He had used a wood base and aluminium veneer. It was pulled slightly from the sheath, which was emblazoned with large jewels that hardly seemed real at all, but were stunning and smart in their own right. In this painting, look closely at the upturned soil in the garden. Imagine Charmania's sword. Imagine it now buried in the garden, in this painting. Examine the uninspired tomato vines. Their drooping and bare stalks, fully revealed, but impossibly beautiful in Atiano's rendition. How will you be remembered? Atiano does not expect viewers to know about the now defunct Joya's Cafe in Cornwall in Western Europa, but she certainly expects viewers to understand it. If the title says there is a sword in the painting, then there is a sword in the painting, and it is your job to find it. The garden at Joya's and even the sword to which it refers were clear influences on Atiano's seminal masterpiece. And the longer I have looked at this painting, the more I wonder if the sword is buried in the ground. An on-the-line tribute to our post-reckoning international order of peace, or perhaps knowing Atiano's wry sense of humour and love of subtle symbolic critiques, perhaps the sword has been dug up. Look closely at the mound of dirt. The art of the bound could suggest a burial of weaponry. But in the oblong black patch toward the top, I see the suggestion of a hole rather than a heap. The sword is missing, and Atiano does not know where it is. Perhaps the viewer themselves holds it. Do you? Do you hold? the sword. Painting 102, Marketplace, Summer Afternoon, 1965. A painting of a crowded food market. Notice the almost boneless limbs on the merchants. The apple cart vendor in the lower right has an arced elbow that never quite reaches a point. Her knees are nearly S-shaped. You can see the ocean over the tents in the background. Many books refer to this scene as St. Ives. This is likely Plymouth. I recognise that view from my brief time living near there. But perhaps I'm wrong. This is why we make art. To help us remember more beautifully, not more clearly. Painting 103, Stapler, 1968. It is a painting of a black swing line stapler on a black background. The audacity of this painting irritated many older artists, as it looks like a poorly lit photo in an office supply catalogue. Look closely at the black of the stapler and the black of the background. Is all darkness the same? How absent is light in the absence of light? Atieno on the surface is displaying her technical skills. It is photographic quality in every way. It looks like almost an advertisement here on the Ulster Museum wall. Perhaps Atieno is making a commentary on the commentary of the pop art movement. But most likely she is simply showing off her technique. She was quite prolific in her art, and they're all good works, as you can see here in Belfast. But in her mind, mastery of form was mastery of art. But in my mind, an artist can always do more. In Cornwall, there were cliffs overlooking the sea. 
At high tide, I would take off my clothes and dive the 10 meters drop. I encouraged Claudia to dive with me, but she couldn't do it. These beautiful cliffs along an endless cool sea. A scene she could paint and did, but not one she could truly explore. For fear of what? Not heights. She did not flinch at bending over the ledge. Not water, either. She swam regularly when she could walk down to the shore. I always wanted her to jump, to plunge, to risk pain or embarrassment, to feel bodily the glory of this rare nature, to paint something truly epic, busy, tall, complex, masterful, to make more astonishing what was already astonishing, to free fall into the vastness that contains both wilderness and tranquility. But when eyes were on Claudia, she demurred. She believed in frightful conspiracies and intimidated power brokers of the new society. But when the world looked at her for commentary, she sometimes just wanted to paint staplers. There's been so much talk about Atiano recently, so much speculation. People say she's disappeared. <laughs> this seems ridiculous to me. Artists are reclusive sometimes. We need to be. The world is our inspiration, sure, but also our most dangerous distraction. It is more likely her so-called disappearance is not a disappearance at all, but an absence, a hiatus, a time spent away from the pressures of celebrity to rethink her artistry. Look closely at the Swing Line logo in the painting. What does it mean to be convinced to buy something? Within the Wires is brought to you by Blue Apron, a better way to cook. My wife Jillian and I make Blue Apron every week. It has nothing to do with not knowing how to cook, although with Blue Apron's simple recipes and complete provisions, it would be super easy, even for the most novice chef. No, we like making Blue Apron because it's something we can do together. We split up prepping the vegetables, cooking the rice, setting the table, cleaning the dishes. We watch reruns of Property Brothers when we do this. We talk about our days and we say things like, Open floor plans have gotten out of control. If we ever buy a new house, we're going to put four walls on every room just to spite HGTV. We'll text each other in the day to find out what time we want to eat dinner. Then we'll send each other cute emojis like the one of the bear cub flying a prop plane with a banner that reads, I'd like to have spicy beef tacos with cherry tomato salsa and creamy corn. And then the other will reply with the emoji of an iguana writing a novel on an old-timey typewriter with the first sentence that reads, Actually, I've been wanting to make spring vegetables and toasted pearl couscous with spicy halloumi-style cheese. And then we'll end up making the asparagus and summer squash curry with ginger lime peanuts. It doesn't matter because it's all delicious. When you cook with incredible ingredients, you will make incredible meals. And hopefully you will do it with someone you love. Not someone I love. Are you making my wife dinner? That's creepy. Don't do that. Thanks again to Blue Apron for supporting Within the Wires. Check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash WTW. That's WTW for Within the Wires. And now, back to the Ulster Museum. Painting 104. Fingers Together, 1967. Atiano here has painted a self-portrait of sorts with her sometimes partner Pavel Zubov, a lesser-known sculptor she had met in 1965 in St. Petersburg. The painting shows two sets of fingers intertwined. The simple contrast in skin tones and the smooth lines of each knuckle create a crosshatch pattern that strikes the eye even from 50 metres away. Look at the fingers. Can you tell which fingers are the woman's and which are the man's? In your mind, what signifies a male finger versus a female finger? Are race and skin colour connected? In Pavel's skin you can see subtle indications of veins, the pulse one can feel in physical contact with another. Notice the soft brushwork, creating an almost gauzy effect. 
the natural inclination is to assume gentle love. Young love, even, given the plump smoothness of each finger. Although, given this was 1967, Atieno might be giving herself too much credit to paint herself with such supple skin. I would also caution you not to accept too much naive love in this painting. This work is a popular poster to be hung in university dormitories. Its brash idealism is hiding something harsher. Look closely at Atieno's nails, short, chewed down, an indication of stress. Zuboff's are keenly manicured, almost sharpened. His little finger is out of view. Some writers have suggested that she deliberately did not paint it as a symbol of the child they lost only two months before birth. At best, that is a weak symbolic gesture for the immense tragedy of a miscarried child. At worst, it is a lie conceived by hack writers trying to sell papers. As Atiano never carried Zuboff's child, the little finger is not missing. It is hidden from view at this angle, a symbol, yes, but of Zuboff's opacity in love. He had many partners. This should have been fine. Their relationship was polyamorous, as were all of Atiano's relationships. But even with permission, Zuboff felt the need to conceal. He convinced each lover that he was monogamous, hiding each from each. I lived with Claudia for a time. It is large, that house, and often full of people, Claudia, obviously, and Zuboff most of the time. They were passionate, sometimes both naked in front of me, sometimes leaving their bedroom door open. I admired their free spirit, their ability to confront each other with ideas and personal jabs and even great gulping kisses. It was clear that others who lived in the house from time to time were unused to this passionate couple. In that house, the borders between friendship and otherwise were blurred. I can personally attest to this. Lack of transparency to Atiano was equal to deception. If you did not say how you felt to her, whether it was about her art, herself, someone else, or even what kind of tea you would like that afternoon, she believed you to be hiding something. She likewise would be completely honest with you. And as Zuboff never brought any other sexual partners to the house, as Etienne did, she suspected he was hiding something. And she was right. Look again at the intertwining fingers in the painting. Is Atiano being completely honest with you? Are you being honest with anyone? Painting 105 Sunshine Afternoon, 1968 One of Atiano's lesser-known works, Zuboff found it in his basement two years ago. It is a painting of sunlight slicing through grey clouds over what is presumably the Celtic Sea. The water in this picture is choppy. Look at the choppy water. Painting 106. Self-portrait with cat, 1972, unfinished. This painting was recently discovered by Zuboff in his home. Atieno already had a painting called Self-Portrait with Cat, despite claiming never to have had a cat. I asked her about this painting once or twice, and she was completely unwilling to discuss it. I got the sense she simply did not like this work, but yet here is another version of the same picture. In what you can see of her face, she's making the same facial expression as in the original, a wry smile, her eyes fixated to something distant, but her face is older, as is the cat's. Its eyes and neck sagging. The light coming in the window is orange. A sunset. Look closely at her eyes. Are those the eyes of a woman holding a cat she does not own? Whose cat is it? Look at where the brush strokes end in this unfinished work. 
Why would she paint this painting again? Zuboff eventually admitted to having four other lovers, but he refused to tell any of them about the others. He only told Dattiano because, as he said, he loved her more. He added, I would leave them for you, Claudia. I would leave them for you. But she threw a salad fork at him. And she said she couldn't love him back if he did not love the rest of the world as equals. While I believe this sentiment is suffocatingly idealistic, I understood that Atieno saw Zuboff's deception as a lack of respect for himself and the other men and women he was seeing. He prized comfort over truth, and Atieno could not abide that. Over the few years I knew Claudia, we grew close. Which is to say we were with each other often and intensely. Claudia fought and argued with me. She sometimes called me names. But as long as I said how I felt, we could work through our disagreements and convince each other of almost anything. We talked of her ending her relationship with Pavel. Sometimes she threw things. Sometimes I couldn't speak for fear of crying in front of her. Eventually it was thought that Pavel should not come back. Our conversations were so full of passion, honesty, intimacy. <laughs> I still wonder who thought this thought first. Perhaps it was Claudia's idea all along. She ordered Pavel to leave, and he returned. She ordered him to leave again, and he returned, although later than before. After the third command to leave her alone, he seemed not to return at all. But every so often, Claudia would receive parcels with no return address. These boxes would contain a single piece of an animal, a tooth from a fox, or large rodent, an ear cut off a rabbit, and one time, a field mouse, cut in half at the torso, and all of its blood drained. I urged Claudia to call authorities, but she said Pavel always sent her studies of new sculptures he was working on. Atiano began this redux painting self-portrait with Cat, featuring Atiano in her wicker chair on her enclosed patio, the cliffs below her, on her lap, the calico cat. Behind Atiano in the self-portrait, along the cliffs, there is a small figure near the ledge. As she did not finish this painting, it's difficult to say her intention with this rough blotch. Most assume it is a tree, but I have been in that home many days, and there is no tree there. It is a human, or at least a man. I do not know who the man is, or what he wants, or intends. This painting was unfinished because Atiano disappeared. Rather, she left her Cornwall home without taking it with her and left no forwarding address. I do not think she has disappeared. I don't think she's done anything so dramatic. Claudia was last seen at her home in Cornwall in October 1972. Pavel arrived while Claudia was at the market. I answered the door. Pavel and I nodded at each other, but otherwise did not communicate. I left that afternoon to give a lecture at the rebuilt Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, and I've not seen Claudia since. I don't want to imply Pavel and her disappearance, nor give in to suspicions that she is dead. I think, or hope, or some word like that, some word like that, that she's back home near Dodoma, or in a commune in Halifax, or perhaps in another cottage by the sea, wanting us to wait for her next work, something the prolific artist rarely required of us, wanting to challenge and provoke and amaze us. I think that. I hope that. I something, something that.
Within the Wires is written by Jeffrey Craner and Janina Mathewson and performed by Rima Tewiata with original music by Mary Epworth. Find more of Mary's music at maryepworth.com. The voice of Mary Bretnock was Sarah Maria Griffin. Thanks again to Blue Apron. Check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash WTW. And please rate and review Within the Wires on Apple Podcasts and tell your friends about our immersive little show. Also, you can get Within the Wires t-shirts and posters at withinthewires.com. Within the Wires is a production of Night Vale Presents. Check out our other podcasts like Welcome to Night Vale and Alice Isn't Dead and The Orbiting Human Circus of the Air and Conversations with People Who Hate Me. And coming this month, a brand new podcast from Joseph Fink and John Darnielle called I Only Listen to the Mountain Goats and a brand new fiction podcast called It Makes a Sound. Okay, our time is done. It's you time now. Time to stop by the museum gift shop. Grab yourself a souvenir book of paintings about potato cannons. Pick up a poster featuring a vulture in a tuxedo. And buy a commemorative vase made out of baby back ribs. This has been a production of Night Vale Presents. Find out more about us and our shows at nightvalepresents.com.